my name is Sarah Fox and I oversee the Project Management Office at the City of Sydney. I'll be taking you on a journey on how we are transforming our governance in these times and I'm the lucky one with that after lunch time slot via Zoom. So I'll do my best to keep you engaged and I really hope that your catering was better than mine. I also hope that our story uh, is inspiring for you and your PMOs and a good example how organisational transformation can be driven from a PMO in this way. So today I'll touch on the background to this pr project and our North Star, what we're aiming for for this transformation and how we've used soft agile to achieve this change. I'll talk to you briefly about what we've actually changed and how we're managing the change and our learning and our challenges. And there'll be enough time at the end for Q&A, so please jot down your questions. So the background to, I guess, the PMO at the City of Sydney. Uh, the PMO was founded in 2012 at a point where we had over 80 projects with a portfolio of about $85 million. We implemented back then, I wasn't involved back then, but we implemented back then a one size fits all approach and templates really to drive that basic level of compliance and have an uptake and consistency in just standard project management practices. Four years in, other changes were brought into effect uh, in an effort to increase collaboration for our cross-divisional project teams, engage senior managers in governance, uh, and further templates were added and existing templates were just added to. So uh, governance really just grew over time. And in uh, 2019, we conducted a human-centered design review and we found that staff were burdened by the documentation and the sign-off and the layers of governance that had just been gradually added over the, the previous time. And they'd been added to drive certain behaviors, um, but weren't uh, some of them worked, some of them weren't so effective. Uh, so uh, when I joined the PMO, we had monthly steering uh, committee papers that regularly kind of reached 200 pages long. Uh, decision makers were not able to get across the information and they felt they didn't have enough information for complex projects, but too much for low and less risk projects. We also heard from staff intending uh, the senior management uh, program control groups that they valued the input and the cross divisional support for their projects. Uh, but when the agenda was packed, it was clear that the members of these uh, committees only read parts of the paper that really mattered to them and their teams. And so governance felt like a bit of a bump in a road for some staff and they felt that there was li limited value add. We also had other insights like it takes, it took three times as longer to get a document signed off as it did to actually write the document in itself. Uh, and staff were using sign offs as the only means for collaborating at sometimes, writing documents and, and doing you know, the project discovery in isolation uh, and then just sending it through that sign off process. Uh, and, and that meant actually, you know, we weren't driving the consultation, the collaboration that we wanted to see across our project teams. So our findings were, you know, system and process issues uh, that had just built up over time, as well as cultural issues too. And we knew we needed transformation right from the executive level down to the project team level. So uh, with this, um, I, also just before I launch into the change, I just want to you know, give a disclaimer, like we have rapidly uh, delivered change in the last four months. It's been incredible, but it has taken about nine months of incubation. I delivered uh, recommendations to our executive exactly a year ago from the Human Centred Design Review. Uh, and the executive were in principle very supportive, but there was quite a significant amount of change and an executive really needed to have about nine months to work through, especially the governance operating model change and what changes we need to, to make there. Uh, but certainly we have driven uh, with that support and with that understanding of the why and why, why it's needed, we've been able to drive a lot of change quite quickly in the last four months. So this slide here, this is our how might we statement. This is a statement that we use to, to ideate and generate and come up with solutions after hearing all, all some of those problems that I just shared with you. We felt if we could solve for this problem here, we would significantly improve the user's experience and have a value add government. 
governance process. Uh, as you know that there's lots of problems in, in our very systems and choosing what to focus on is really difficult at times and you can focus on the wrong thing and not actually address what the root cause is. And taking a human centred design approach enabled us to do that. And we really heard from people ultimately, they wanted to feel confident in decision making to have the right information up front. And they also, from projects teams, they wanted a governance that adds value to their day-to-day, -day, wants to add value to their collaboration with their project teams and to enable them to get on with delivery of great projects. So, um, this is uh, an example of the process that we went through. Uh, some of you may have heard me present on this last year where I talk to you through the different steps of these phases. All I wanna say on this slide though, is we're here in implementation and we've been using an agile approach to implementation, which has worked really well uh, coming out of the human centered design process. So why does governance really matter? And why should we continually involve and improve project governance? And I think this is really important as practitioners that we lead the way with this. Uh, otherwise the business will also lead the way and, and, change, and, and change, I guess, our practices as we go. It's really important and it's something that every organisation needs to work out itself is answering the why builds your case for change. For the City of Sydney, really projects are, you know, a really critical mechanism for us to, develop, to deliver cultural, economic, social and sustainability value to our community and deliver on our strategy. This is important as we have over 350 live projects and we invest a significant amount of time and resources every year. Uh, and it's really our responsibility to do this effectively and efficiently to meet customer needs and outcomes, be that internal or external. So this is our North Star. This is what we're aiming for with this transformation. And this is something we'll be measuring along the way. We do have some baseline data as well that we'll be using. So ultimately, we're seeking quicker, transparent and more informed decision making. We heard that this was needed all the ways from, you know, the executive all the way down to the project teams. Uh, we heard also that we needed a fit for purpose governance where a project to upgrade a kitchen in a community hall is not required to go through the same rigorous governance process as a new $100 million swimming pool and a governance that adds value. So process and documentation to help decision makers and project teams deliver great projects, not hinder them, not add an extra hurdle that they need to jump. So these are our measures of success and what we'll use to keep track as we implement this change. We also sought to do this by, you know, revising, we sought to do this by revising our project governance model and our delivery framework and our PMO templates. So um, everyone's probably quite familiar with this quote here. Um, on the 11th of March, uh, I kind of summons about 20 people in a room in Town Hall and we, we called this team project Clarity. And we had a fantastic kickoff meeting where we kind of all aligned about, you know, what we wanted to achieve. We knew we needed to achieve this rapidly. We knew we needed to achieve this differently. And we all agreed that we we're gonna try Agile ways of working. Uh, little did we know that, you know, over the other side of the world later in a day that a global pandemic was going to be announced. So fortunately, I, you know, un oblivious to this, um, before we were wrapped up this meeting, I managed to lock in some sprint leads. So staff agreed to leave aspects of the change. This was very fortunate, I think, in hindsight, because we were all thrown into a world of chaos, not just at work, but at home, as we were all working out how we're managing this new work from home arrangement. Uh, it would have been very challenging to kick off this project at that point. Uh, and I think we would have had to wait maybe a month before people people had the headspace to engage. But fortunately, we were able to lock them in. And whilst it was challenging, it also really helped uh, those staff members kind of anchor in as a team. Uh, and we worked our way through it together. So we pivoted. We pivoted massively. Uh, so not only was this project going to be the first internally delivered soft agile approach, uh, we now needed to do this all virtually and rapidly uh, whilst we all came to terms with the new normal. And if any of you remember this, uh, this Friends episode where Ross is like shouting out pivot as they try and manoeuvre a very large couch up a stairwell that later gets stuck, it did feel like this at some times. Um, but fortunately, like Friends, it's a challenging moment like these that can often build resilience and strengthen teams whilst providing a bit of humour at our own learning navigating this new normal. So this was our approach. 
we had seven sprints, uh, two weeks uh, represented one sprint and we had three and a half months to deliver. We had identified 15 sprint leads to uh, drive different parts of the change through and we tested uh, with over 50 people across the organisation in this time as well. So how we did this, um, really lockdown accelerated uh, our, you know, uh, our approach to soft agile. I had some concerns about us starting this, this out in the flesh, but I actually think moving digitally actually helped us embrace this uh, more easily than what I probably would have had physically in the office. Uh, so our new normal for this project was daily stand-ups. Uh, we had a scrum master and we kept this to 15 minutes only, even though we had a large number of sprint leads, to really demonstrate you can have 15 minute minutes, a uh, 15 minute meetings and get across the information that you need to. This was the one that I was actually wondering if we were doing these physically in the office, if they would work because of the challenges that people have with meetings and, and getting from floor to floor and showing up on time because we did really need that full 15 minutes. We also had, uh, every two weeks, we had a showcase with our project sponsor. This was a critical part of our strategy as it empowered and encouraged the sprint leads that their work was being recognised and it enabled us also to course correct and get real time decisions. Our project sponsor, I should add, was an agile sceptic prior to this experience. And at the end of the project, he's a very supportive advocate of soft agile. And I also should add, he was also very busy during the time of uh, the pandemic and he was working enormous hours, but he never canceled and he always turned up to our showcase meetings, which really set, um, it really set the culture and it really drove home to the sprint leads that this was important and this project did matter to the executive. We also led re retrospectives, which Neil spoke to this morning and, and we were able to participate in a retrospective. And we did this every two weeks after the showcase. This is something that uh, I really love leading retrospectives and reflecting, uh, but this is something that Initially, I was wondering, is two weeks too much? Uh, should we really reflect after each showcase? Um, but every time that we did and we checked in as a team, we learned something and it was a real opportunity. It gave the team a voice to give feedback and there were various members of the team and some sprint leads came in, you know, at sprint three or sprint five. Uh, and so we really needed to onboard those new members and it gave just the team the opportunity to course correct ourselves. Uh, and every time we did, it just strengthened us and it strengthened us as a team. Uh, and then finally, the test and learn approach, which I'll go through more um, in this later slide, in another slide, because this was really critical uh, to um, rapidly rolling this out. And of course, you know, the uptakes of the communication tools and the collaboration tools, which many of us have spoken of and heard from our speakers today. Um, we embraced Miro uh, wholeheartedly, and uh, that tool is just something that we'll be taking forward in the way that we collaborate and work with each other. Uh, it's um, also, amazingly it's cost uh, uh, we've had a lot of savings through um, post-it notes because uh, Miro you, you have ample amount of post-it notes you don't have to pay for them as well so moving on to uh, the next slide here this is just an example of our daily stand-up and showcase board uh, these are snips from our Miro boards that we're using that tool for um, the first here is of our daily stand-up and you can see here that the different colored post-it notes represent the different streams and we discovered power in stand-ups in the following ways. Um, they really helped us focus on bite-sized chunks of work, you know, through the sprints. Uh, and this was really helpful during COVID as a lot of things felt very overwhelming and felt, where do we start? And so taking an agile and sprint approach really just helped us break it down. And then having the oversight of the stand-ups is we're putting our, you know, our two-week objectives really on a page for everyone to see. So it's motivating seeing others move actions and we feel motivated as well to complete our work uh, and also to see those post-it notes progressing uh, and I think Neil also spoke to uh, the positive feeling that, that that does when you see work progressing and how motivating that is. The also important thing about stand-ups is transparency. So, uh, you know, I've, I'm sure many of you have been involved in projects and sometimes you find out probably too close to the end that things uh, haven't worked. Uh, and with Agile and stand-ups, it gives you that progress. You can actually see how things are tracking and you could address roadblocks uh, as a team or reallocate if you need to, if someone's swamped with work. 
Uh, and the other one here is just a snip from our showcase board where we'll actually um, active showcasing our achievements. And we asked, you know, really, um, really direct questions. Can we release this template? Uh, do we need to continue to, uh, you know, test this? Uh, are, are we on the right track? And this is what we're thinking about next steps. So we're asking those direct questions of our project sponsor. So our project sponsor needed to turn up ready and to make those decisions to enable the project to move forward. So this is our test and learn, um, you know, the test and learn approach was absolutely fundamental and underpinned the success of our project. Um, and this is something that was really challenging from a cultural perspective. Uh, through the human centre design review, we had developed a draft framework. Um, we had rapidly developed and prototyped that when I presented that to the executive last year as part of the recommendations. Uh, but when I presented this framework to the kickoff meeting in March, I, I did so very loosely and said that, you know, this needs to be really tested and challenged because this is what we came up through the human centre design process, our ideation process and some of our solutions, but we really need to kind of think about this framework and then start developing the templates uh, and have a focus on really the information that people need and the information that is going to help project teams. We shouldn't develop the templates to match this framework. We should actually develop the templates first, thinking about the questions that are needed and have a framework where we've, we, we agreed on the overall structure and the phases of the project life cycle, but we didn't have to be locked in to um, those uh, detailed in those phases and the amount of templates that are needed for that. Um, so this made people um, feel a little bit uncomfortable uh, with testing uh, the templates and they wanted to have, I guess, you know, 100% assurance um, and understanding of how this works and how this fits together, which is only natural. And we really had to work this through as a team. So we encouraged our sprint leads to get out there and test um, if they had developed templates uh, that, you know, test the business case that was only 50% complete, like we knew that it wasn't 100%. Um, and we did this for rapid fire and ID generation. So we just had little workshops and then we sought people's feedback. Uh, and then we found that taking this approach, we were more open to the user's feedback and we were able to get a final prototype much quicker uh, that was really informed by the end users. We then um, decided to, with the, our sponsor approval, even though the overall framework had not been approved by the executive, we had sponsor approval to start using these templates in our steering committees and PCGs. So we, we released them 90% complete uh, and we had project teams use them, people who nominated to use them, and they would go up uh, through the steering committee uh, for further feedback. And this also helped open up and prepare all, including executive, about the change that, that was coming. And mind you, no, none of them had the headspace to really think about it. And, you know, there was no way that I could have had an agenda item uh, to talk to all the executive about governance transformation in the height of the pandemic. Uh, so this was a way that we kind of eased into it. And what they did see, though, was rapid improvements um, and to the templates when they gave feedback from one meeting to the next. And they also heard from the staff who were completing the templates how much easier it was to fit in, uh, to fill out uh, and to complete. In some cases, you know, we reduced the number of pages from 10 to 2 and it was much more straightforward. Uh, so this enabled a groundswell of support just by releasing and, and testing and learning. Uh, so look, um, you know, from, from there, you know, the halfway mark, um, you know, we, at the halfway mark, we decided to do a soft launch uh, of uh, six templates and we organised lunch and learns via um, MS Teams. And this was an optional session for people to attend and some of them had been involved with testing the frameworks. And what surprised us was we had over 200 people across the organisation turn up to two separate lunch and learns that was optional and we're just talking about PMO templates. Um, so, you know, but people turned up and it was really, um, really encouraging. I guess the style of the presentation, we made it very engaging. Uh, so we had each of the sprint leads share what the template was, why would you use it, when would you use it and what to look out for. Really simple two minute pieces and we had um, sprint leads from across the business that people can identify with. So it wasn't just the PMO. Uh, and we received also feedback in those meetings and questions came up in those meetings that helped us further tweak those templates. So um, 
We also, at the start of the project, we had a feedback form. So if, the, if people weren't giving feedback through the sessions, we've really encouraged people to go to our website. And we still have this open now and will do until the end of October, where we will continue to make rapid improvements and changes based on user feedback. So look, what, what we've achieved. Uh, we've transformed our governance operating model. So over time, so we have, you know, clearer decision pathways um, and these decision pathways were, were becoming, you know, they were increasing, groups were layered on top of groups uh, and then uh, it was very difficult sometimes for projects to navigate and so we, we heard that, you know, decision making can take up to two months or three months on some projects, which was really causing a lot of delays. So we've stripped all of this back and we have a greater focus on budget and priorities. Uh, we have a project gateways approvals and we have a, a focus on project delivery. Uh, we also have a new project management framework, light and standard pathways. Uh, note the two pathways, and we thought we might have three, but through testing and approach, we've got two pathways only. Uh, and we've co-created with the business 15 new and revised templates. So this slide talks a little bit more to the achievements that we've we've had under each of those headings. Uh, so for the governance, you know, we've we've got revised terms of reference. We've got clarity around roles and responsibilities. We've also um, stripped them back to right size management membership. So we've heard from a lot that a lot of people are in meetings all day. So we've really focused on having those people that need to be involved in decision making and allowing those SMEs to come at other times when, when they've got items to speak to only rather than having large um, levels of membership. So there's been quite a big change from the executive through to senior managers in terms of membership. We've also reduced the number of approval uh, processes for projects to go through. For the project frameworks, you know, we have a fit for purpose governance pathways. First time we've had a light pathway uh, and we've really increased accountability for project sponsors in that light pathway, having them as a final sign off once the project goes through the discovery phase. We've got greater focus on you know, um, discovery upfront, uh, spending time understanding the problem. And we've also built in change management to our project management framework for the first time uh, and ensuring that comes through in the planning stages of our projects. We have simplified uh, for the, the co-created new templates. We've simplified and streamlined our templates and we've increased our focus on understanding the why and the customer needs and outcomes. So when it comes to change management, I, I think there are some real benefits uh, with taking both a human-centered design and an agile approach. Um, this has led us to be very successful, I guess, in implementing the governance changes, you know, as the organization is coming to terms with COVID. Uh, and I'm not sure about your organizations, but we're really putting our head up now and kind of thinking, you know, how can we work through some of those adaptive transformation issues or tech um, and moving away from those technical kind of fixes that were really focused on initially is like get the budget right. Now we're at that next step and looking up, but we've been able to implement this change alongside of that and ready, ready to drive transformation in the organisation. So using human-centred design, we're really able to hone in on what is the real problem. And using Agile, uh, the changes were built, um, you know, by the business and for the business. So it wasn't the PMO rolling out these changes, it's the organisation rolling out these changes and building the changes themselves. Uh, Agile also enabled us to deliver value early and often, and this built confidence and trust. And uh, going out wide, um, you know, and involving a lot of people across the organisation meant it's just not the PMO championing it. There's others in the business who will continue to drive and support this change moving forward. So I think that's where this approach has really helped us. Uh, this slide here, um, really, really kind of captures, I guess, the involvement of human centred design and agile and lean. And I should, I should stress though, you know, that we had a complex pro uh, problem to start with. We had multiple stakeholders, pain points across the whole life cycle. Human centred design enabled us to understand these problems uh, and that we had the right design for the problems that we were solving for. So if you had a less complex project, if you had a, a project, you know, that might just require best practice, then possibly you can just jump into Agile. But
course, we had a complex problem. Uh, and there is a um, kind of a problem framework I, that a, I think Snowden, um, and it's in a Harvard Business uh, Review article talks about, and that article will be really helpful for you to understand what type of problem you have and what tools that you can then apply to those problems. So using human-centred design, we'll be able to get the, des the right design and then Agile enabled us to get the design right. So I've spoken about, we knew we needed a new framework and we had the idea that there may be three different pathways, but through test and learn, we discovered we only needed two. So Agile allowed us, allowed us to test and to um, really get that design firmed up. So we aren't there yet, but if we wanted to improve aspects of these changes, uh, we could then look at lean. So once we've implemented them, we can go back and look, how can we make these more efficient and effective? Uh, so look, my, my encouragement to you all is really try and understand the problem you're seeking to solve first, and then the tools that you'll use to, to, to do that and to drive that change. So look, our learnings. Um, you know, we we really shifted, you know, shifting the way that we work does take time. Uh, it did take us, you know, three to four weeks until we really felt comfortable and I was leading this change uh, and was just really aware of the stress that everyone was feeling as well, uh, you know, with all the changes that were happening. Uh, but it took us a good three to four weeks to get comfortable with the retrospectives and the showcases uh, and also those regular check-ins. And yes, you do need to put your post notes up to be transparent, uh, to, to get comfortable as a team. It was, it was very new for all of us. Uh, we also, you know, needed the courage uh, to commit and to work differently. And I think this is where COVID did have some benefits in terms of driving us to, to work through, um, you know, some challenges and, and some blockages that we might have all personally had, um, enabled many of us to just step into these new ways of working and take the courage to try them out uh, because we had um, no, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't work face to face to work through that. Um, and it also gave us the motivation, you know, having that oversight over how others are progressing and just a natural motivator to say, oh, look, they're really achieving. If I can move my post-it notes across, I'm also delivering as well. And the sponsor also was really encouraging aspect of, of this project. Um, so with Agile as well, there's, I guess there's real-time governance and transparency and accountability, and that has a lot of, um, you know, positive impacts on the team. And bite-sized chunks really meant that we could deliver and deliver greater output in the long run. Um, I think, you know, if we didn't take an Agile approach, you know, I'd probably still be here uh, trying to roll out changes to two templates, let alone a whole framework. Uh, and then really ownership of the change, um, you know, huge, huge ownership across the organisation uh, and with, with sprint leads driving that change, they have the ease to the ground, listening, hearing feedback and then feeding that back into the team. And look, the virtual benefits were really quite surprising. Um, you know, from, from the P&O and, you know, we've run, uh, you know, divisional meetings, we've run kind of lunch and learn meetings before. Um, virtual meetings, we found that people actually show up. So we had optional lunch and learns, uh, but we have staff across the city. We have staff in depots that are working on projects. So it meant that, you know, the training that we're rolling out and the support we're writing, rolling out was easily accessible to all. So people were showing up and the temptation to skip, I guess, if you're running late, to a meeting. Sometimes you might have the temptation to skip the meeting, but with Zoom, you can just jump in and you're there. No one has, no one really sees that you're too late, especially if there's a hundred people on the line. Um, and really what we delivered in, in this time is significant. Uh, we were quoted from an external agency um, about $400,000 to kind of develop revised templates and uh, new project governance frameworks um, and, and to drive that change throughout the organisation. Uh, and so, you know, with a cross-divisional team, we were able to deliver this internally uh, for very, um, very limited cost. So uh, the challenges, uh, look, you know, work, work from home transition was hard. We did lose a few sprint leads. Um, some of these sprint leads were very involved in parts of the business that uh, were responding to, you know, crises and, and emergency support for our community. Uh, so that's only natural. Did we lose sprint leads in that space? And also we had a few people a bit reluctant to test just to say, look, I, I don't have the headspace to get involved in this. Um, and so that, that was, completely optional. 
Uh, the desire gets to have things 100% right. Uh, so, you know, this I, I saw this struggle uh, more at a senior management level than I did uh, at kind of the project team level and um, really, you know, to, to be concerned and to be worried about putting stuff out that's 50% and that we don't know all the answers. And I guess that's part of our society and how we've been brought, raised and brought up almost in our learning at our school. And I know that's changing in the curriculum today. Um, but I think this this was a real barrier and something that we had to work continually through as a team to have the courage to put things out, even if we, we didn't know all the answers and we, we wanted to get feedback. So really that's, that's leading on to the cultural change. Um, some of the, I guess, experiences that we had, our, our most senior managers found this, this more difficult, uh, who were our sprint leads. Um, they were involved in quite a lot of other meetings and, and to actually attend regularly and to turn up and be present was something really challenging. And I think for Agile to work, you really need those people present uh, and they need to be regular in their attendance. And, and so we had a few conversations around this and, you know, if, um, you know, some chose to delegate uh, when, when things were a bit challenging and really focusing on bike-sized chunks of work. And some, this is something that some of our senior managers struggled to as well really to articulate smaller pieces of work um, when they wanted to have understanding of the bigger picture and ensure that, you know, we're driving kind of that larger picture and they wanted to see changes uh, communicated more broadly before they actually committed to these bite-side pieces of work. So we had lots of conversations around that and to get people to commit to actually those bite-sized pieces of work, understanding the context, understanding what we're aiming for and those North Stars. So um, I will wrap up with this quote um, and you may have heard this quote before. I think it's quite fitting for um, our times now and especially at the city. Um, most transformation programs satisfy themselves with shifting the same old furniture about in the same old room. But real transformation requires that we redesign the room itself. It requires that we change the thinking behind our thinking. So today we've spoken about the tool set that we've used. Some of the other presenters have spoken about the various tools that they've used. And many of us have shared also examples of our skill set, um, how we're practicing the learnings, how we're mastering the tools, how we're resolving conflict and fostering a culture of innovation. This leadership also uh, requires a mindset. Uh, how are we as leaders showing up? What mindset and attitudes are we encouraging in our practice to drive the change that we need? Uh, and, you know, having uh, this perspective from the tool set, skill set and mindset um, is really important for, for driving uh, leadership across our organisations and transformation. So um, we've now come to the end of uh, the presentation. And uh, so thank you for all who are still engaged and listening. I'm really interested to hear your questions and also hear from you um, if you've been on a similar journey. So thank you. Wonderful, Sarah. Thank you. Always, uh, always enjoy hearing your journey. I'm sorry, I've changed room. It's a bit echoey in here now. Hopefully everybody can still hear me okay. Um, so yeah, always, always great because uh, I know you've been on this journey um, for some while. Um, Fiona had a question for you. Fiona, you should be able to talk now if you'd like to ask Sarah. Uh, I'll go to Jerry. Come back to Fiona. Jerry, did you have a question? Yeah, hi, uh, Louise. And um... Thanks for the presentation, Sarah. Really interesting. So we, we're very much uh, only now beginning to um, have agile projects uh, introduced to our business. So that that change in, in mindset, particularly at the senior management level, I'm particularly interested in in how you uh, over, overcame some of the challenges that you were calling out in that space, if, if indeed you have or, or, or is it still continuing? Yeah, thank you for the question, Jerry. Look, uh, it is something that is still continuing. Uh, this was the first project that we delivered uh, in an agile way internally. And uh, there was another project that used Agile um, looking at our community resilience and transformation in COVID. So they also did an Agile approach um, at the same time as this. So there's learnings from, from that experience. It was really hard, to be honest, because... Uh, 
you know, some of these peers are, all, are, are also my seniors and uh, you need to be able to feel comfortable to be having courageous conversations uh, in terms of what's what's what they need to do to show up and what they need to do to make this work and also be able to call out with them, is this the right project for them to be part of? So, you know, it, it's not going to work, I think, for, for everyone. Uh, and I think that's something, uh, you know, you can encourage your culture and you can certainly be hiring for culture. But I think uh, for some people, I think it's going to be a big struggle. And that's something that organisations will need to, 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 to deal with. And, and that's where it's really important for agile approaches to be driven from the top. At the city, we haven't had a wild, widespread, you know, everyone adopt agile approach. We've got interest in it. Teams are taking it up. There is support for it. Um, but I think there'd need to be a big cultural change and message coming from, you know, our organisation capability team and our executive in terms of what they're expecting now and what capabilities and behaviours they're expecting uh, to see uh, if for teams adopting agile. Uh, so look, it did mean, you know, some courageous and some honest conversations. And so if you do have scrum masters in those roles you need to be equipping them uh, and ensuring that they've got the support behind them whether that be um, support from the top or you know that they're able to have those conversations because yeah it, it was you know it, it is challenging it's something different and it's a cultural change and you do have you know the great thing about agile it's very leveling so you've got you know staff at all levels you know we had someone working on helping you know from our finance team a graduate who's helping pretty up the templates for us they they were involved in our sprints as well as our senior managers and presenting, you know, to our chief um, operating officer who was our sponsor on their results on what they delivered in that sprint. So it was very levelling, very transparent in terms of how everyone was going and that is sometimes confronting uh, for, for senior managers as well. And I think, you know, it's, it's asking them the question, are you going to dedicate time to this? Because that's what's important, that they show up, they have time and they engage in the process. I guess that's the expectation, right, from the project sponsor um, throughout the team, across the team. Thanks, Sarah. Does that answer your question, Jerry? Yes, yes, it does. Thanks, Sarah. That's really interesting. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Fiona, you should, uh, you should be with us now. I am. Thank you. Uh, my question was, I was curious as to what you meant by soft agile exactly. You mentioned that a couple of times earlier yeah. in your presentation. Yeah, so we're, we've, uh, we kind of picked and, choosed <laughs> and chose um, from the Agile approach. We weren't following a strict framework of Agile, which I know that, you know, there, there is very strict kind of frameworks and approaches around delivery of IT projects. Uh, so we chose, I guess, going back, I'll see if I can go back to um, the slides, but we really focused on, I guess, those rituals of the daily stand-ups, the retrospectives, the showcases, uh, and and the test and learn approach, those were the rituals and that was the approach that we chose from Agile. So that's why we, we call it soft Agile because we weren't adhering strictly to a framework. Uh, we were um, really adopting the principles of Agile that we felt would help streamline our work and our efficiency to be able to deliver the transformation that we needed. Great, thanks Sarah. I think um, that term soft Agile it's a great one, actually. You don't hear it used a lot. I think a lot of people talk about hybrid and, you know, there's lots of other terminology for it. But, you know, my own personal view on the use of Agile is that whatever environment we're on, we should be being pragmatic about the tools uh, and frameworks that we use. So it's a great illustration of that. Uh, Will, you had a, had a question for Sarah? Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sarah. That was uh, really interesting. And it sounds like you've had a great outcome in, you know, such a short period of time. Uh, my question was about change management. Really interested to understand more the role of how you've positioned change management within your PMO. Are you using it as a, a centralised change management function as opposed to being, you know, out in the business? Can you just give us some more insight into, into that? Yeah, look, this is, um, this is really interesting. It's the, f it's the first time the organisation uh, has really adopted change management now is through the PMO. So I had support, though, from our organisational capability team who have attended the ProSci courses, who are ProSci accredited, and they were interested to roll out change management across the organisation. Uh, so I engaged them, working with them quite closely, and I helped them, uh, you know, we developed a, a tool 
a toolkit essentially for change management and have made that available for projects, but also they're making that now available across the organisation. So it's a really great outcome. I guess the need to have change management incorporated into our project management framework really drove this. Uh, and that's something that the business will be picking up further, you know, for the BAU. Uh, so look, essentially, you know, we're just making the tools available to project teams and organisational capability will be providing the training uh, for, for all, you know, staff, whether they work in projects or BAU, on what change management is and how to man manage change effectively, uh, you know, taking on, you know, we've taken a pro-sci approach as well to, to that. Uh, so look, yes, it's it's been, I think, really led uh, through this project, but something uh, that there was interest and in, we've just really picked that up and worked uh, quite closely with other areas of the organisation to drive that change together. Great, thanks Sarah. We've got uh, time for one more question. We'll go to Sam. Thanks Louise and thanks so much Sarah for your presentation. I just had a quick question around um, uh, establishing MVPs. You mentioned getting to that 50-60% of sort of area and being able to position to test and experiment with what you had created with stakeholders. What did some of those early conversations look like, you know, with stakeholders and those involved around what an MVP constitutes, what it should look like and, and how you went and iterated from there? Yeah, look, we, we were just really upfront <laughs> with them. Um, so first there was a conversation with the Project Clarity Sprint Leads going, yeah, we think this is at 50, 60%, you're ready to go. So as a team, we'd look at it and we'd say, yep, we think this is ready to launch. When we did launch it and we had, uh, you know, organised kind of workshops for feedback, we'd send it out there. We'd ask people to plug in their project kind of information if it was a tool for that. Um, or, you know, we had a team check-in, for instance, that we're piloting as well. And and so we'd, we'd, we'd send it out there. People would then test it and then we'd organise a workshop virtually uh, to get feedback on it. And we had some really clear questions but at the start of that and also in the email that we sent out we just made sure it was really kind of light touch to go look we're just testing this we want to know your feedback what are the gaps what needs to be improved um, we really want to hear from you and hear your thoughts so it was just presenting it we really had to position it as this is not um you know, this is not 100% complete uh, and we want to hear from you. Um, so, look, it wasn't, you know, there wasn't a, um, you know, a, we were just very transparent, I guess, with, with the MVP. We didn't actually communicate. Some people didn't know what an MVP was. We were just saying, look, we're just testing this very early, give us your feedback. Uh, and uh, we tried when we could, when we had that understanding of the broader picture to provide that in those meetings. Uh, but if we didn't have the broader picture, we would be transparent about that. Thanks, Sarah. Great. And look, I must sneak in one last question, if it's okay. Um, you talked about um, right-sizing memberships of governance forums. Can you very quickly tell us how, how you went about that? Because a lot of organisations struggle with it. Yeah, and look, I think we're going to be feeling a little bit of pain um, over the next few months as people come to terms with it. Uh, because, again, I think uh, some of our senior managers will find it hard uh, that we, they're not on those meetings anymore because we have right-sized. Uh, so... The executive really have played a major role in deciding who needs to be on those memberships. So that's where we have collaborated very closely with executive and the executive are also playing a, a major role in deciding who the sponsors are uh, for the project because we're really shaking up sponsorship as well. Uh, and so what that looks like is really, you know, we have kind of a rule of thumb kind of seven, seven plus or minus two as standing members. Uh, and if there is a requirement for more, I guess there needs to be justification for that. Uh, and then also having clear kind of lists of SMEs that get drawn upon at certain times to come uh, to those meetings. We are trying to really drive collaboration where collaboration needs to be, and that's that project team level. So what we learnt is that, you know, I think it's just what, what organizations do, what systems do, what, what happens over time is that people are not, uh, you know, we are so busy that we're not across sometimes what our project teams are, are doing and, and how we can be supporting those cross-divisional project teams and uh, senior managers show up to meetings to try and catch things, uh, to get, you know, across things organisational-wide and those meetings are used as a bit of a, you know, a catch and, and that buffer. And so there's a risk with us taking some of those extra layers away 
Uh, but we're also emphasising that if you're a project sponsor uh, and you're on a project team, you need to be collaborating and, and be really clear about, you know, what sort of advice and support you need from across the organisation to deliver projects rather than putting layer of governance. Really, that's what we do. We just put governance layers on to drive collaboration. And we know that, you know, governance uh, doesn't necessarily drive collaboration. It's people that drive collaboration. And so that's the message we're wanting to get out. Uh, and I think, you know, I think we're going to have some learnings in this process because um, I think that's the cultural change is, is that, you know, collaboration. And that's what we're wanting to see uh, both from the top and the bottom up. Thanks, Sarah. Roland, if you've got a very quick question, um, you can uh, let me allow you to talk. There you go. If you'd like to ask a very quick question, Roland. Yes, I would. Thanks, Sarah. That was an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, you mentioned that you also increased the accountability of sponsors. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so uh, at the moment, uh, we have um, our executive, our executive actually deciding tomorrow on, on who our project sponsors will be. Um, but at the moment, some of those executives, they sponsor over 100 projects. So <laughs> um, they're not able to get across 100 projects effectively. And so with having the light uh, pathway, we've actually um, enabled project sponsors to sign off documentation in the planning stage uh, right through to close out which is it's actually placing stronger accountability on those sponsors that they're the ultimate decision maker on, you know, the PMP, on the change requests, on the closeout, and hence responsible as well. So we're, I'll be running, a, I guess, a soft training as well for project sponsors in October, uh, both new and old to say, look, these are the principles of sponsorship. These are the, the activities we expect you to engage in with your project teams. You're accountable for this project and you're accountable for any go to green plans if they're, you know, projects are amber or red. Mm -hmm. uh, and now that we've got a, a project delivery panel, which is part of the governance operating model changes, uh, sponsors will be required to attend those when we do deep dives on projects and when we review project status reports. So it's really kind of shaking it up um, in terms of, you know, roles of sponsors. And I guess we're all practitioners and know how important that is uh, but often you know um you know, for us, I guess our governance process kind of minimised sponsors signed off, but you always had another gateway to go through. And now actually sponsors can sign off. So they're the last point of accountability for our light projects. So we are really kind of ramping up and focusing on how do we um, support those project sponsors uh, in their role and understanding, you know, their accountability and responsibility with that. 